back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of 1968. In the last few lectures, we've been talking about the lead-up to the 1968 presidential election and focusing on the Democratic side and the violence and chaos that surrounded the Democratic Convention in Chicago. Nothing could compare to the tumult and chaos on the Democratic side of the 68 election with Johnson's bombshell announcement that he would not seek re-election and the tragic assassination of Robert Kennedy midway through the year. But the Republicans did have their own drama, and a cast of candidates who threw their hat in the ring for the nomination. In this lecture, we'll talk about those candidates, their convention, and the election itself. The front-runner for the Republican nomination was Richard Nixon, who more or less remained in front throughout the election cycle. Nixon was born and raised in a Quaker household in California. His upbringing led him to follow strict conservative values, refraining from drinking, dancing, cursing, and premarital sex. He attended Whittier College, where he was a solid student and participated in drama and excelled in debate comp competitions. He also played football there. He enlisted in the Navy during World War II, and after the war, he ran for and won a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives in the 1946 election. In the late 1940s and early 50s, Nixon gained national prominence as one of the lead investigators on the House Un-American Activities Committee, HUAC, which launched the inquest into communists in Hollywood and helped crack the Alger Hiss case, revealing that Hiss, an aide to FDR, was a Soviet spy. For opponents of FDR, this discovery made Nixon a legitimate hero. Nixon won a seat in the U.S. Senate in 1950, where he continued his anti-communist crusade. He was a chief critic of Harry Truman and his handling of the Korean War and his losing of China to communism. His prominent national reputation, particularly in these anti-communist efforts, led him to be selected as Dwight Eisenhower's vice presidential running mate in 1952, a candidacy that obviously was successful. As vice president, Nixon achieved national acclaim in 1959 when he engaged Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev in what was known as the Kitchen Debate, while the group observed the American National Exhibition in Moscow. His willingness to stand up to Khrushchev again brought him into the national spotlight. Perhaps at the height of his prominence, Nixon easily won the Republican nomination for the presidency in 1960, where he squared off with John F. Kennedy. But Nixon famously flopped in the televised debates against Kennedy, where he was not feeling well and appeared sluggish and unappealing. Kennedy, on the other hand, was handsome, dashing, and charismatic. Kennedy prevailed in a narrow election and Nixon experienced his first significant setback. He retired for a time to California, practicing law and writing, before returning to run for the governor of California in the 1962 election. After an uninspired campaign and speculation that he didn't really want the office, but only wanted to return to national prominence, Nixon lost to incumbent Pat Brown by nearly 300,000 votes. It seemed to signal the end of his career, and Nixon gave a glum concession speech, famously saying, You won't have Nixon to kick around anymore, because, gentlemen, this is my last press conference. But it wasn't. Frustrated by the liberal social dynamics of the 60s, Nixon began to return to national prominence as a voice for law and order. As the late 1960s, and 1968 in particular, grew tumultuous and chaotic, Nixon presented himself as a stabilizing presence. He appealed to what he called the silent majority, as internal polling indicated that most Americans actually did not favor the disruptive tactics of the protesters. And Nixon calculated that he could win the election by strongly opposing the protests. Nixon and his running mate, Spiro Agnew of Maryland, positioned themselves as a countervoice to the hippies and anti-war protesters.
Nixon remained the Republican frontrunner throughout the election cycle, but a number of other prominent Republicans joined the race, only to fall off one after the other. Perhaps his most consequential challenger was Michigan Governor George Romney. Romney was actually born in Mexico, which raised some questions as to his eligibility to run for the presidency. His parents, actually Mormons from Utah, who had sought refuge for a time in Mexico, soon returned to Utah, where Romney was raised. Romney had a hard-working childhood and upbringing, working in the fields and as a carpenter, and then serving as a Mormon missionary in England and Scotland. He moved with his family to Detroit, where he joined the burgeoning auto industry and became the local manager of the American Automobile Manufacturers Association. During World War II, he led the Automotive Council for War Production, a vital role as the auto industry churned out cars, jeeps, and other vehicles for the war effort. While not a politician, he was seen as a national hero. In the post-war atmosphere, Romney led the small car maker AMC in a fight against the so-called Big Three auto companies, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. He made the bold choice of steering AMC towards smaller, more affordable cars, as the other three pushed for bigger and brassier models. Seen as a creative visionary, he appeared on the cover of Time magazine, becoming a household name. Riding this wave of fame, Romney won the governorship in Michigan in 1962, an office he held until 1969, when he was appointed head of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Romney considered a presidential run in 1964, but waited instead for 1968. He announced his candidacy in November 1967, and early polling suggested that he was among the frontrunners, despite some questions about his Mormon background and his birth in Mexico. Unfortunately, Romney gave an interview in which he said, When I came back from Vietnam in 1965, I just had the greatest brainwashing that anybody can get. I no longer believe that it was necessary for us to get involved in South Vietnam to stop communist aggression in Southeast Asia. While an anti-war stance might have found some traction in 1968, his slip in describing himself as brainwashed became the kiss of death for his campaign. Opponents on both sides of the political spectrum pounced, and he could never undo the damage of that statement. As Republican Congressman from Vermont Robert T. Stafford said, If you're running for the presidency, you are supposed to have too much on the ball to be brainwashed. His chances at the presidency were also diminished by his response to the riots in Detroit in the summer of 1967, when his hesitation to crack down eventually required President Lyndon Johnson to call in federal troops. Romney's chances also suffered because he was not a party insider and not really a natural-born politician. While this outsider status brought him a national following, those who were more thoroughly embedded in the Republican Party structure, notably Richard Nixon, doubted that he could hold up under the pressures of the presidency. At the end of the day, while Romney may have offered a refreshing change of tone to rank-and-file Republicans for a time, he lacked the political calculatedness necessary to win a presidential election. A third Republican in the running was Nelson Rockefeller, who was born in Bar Harbor, Maine, amidst the wealth and opulence of the fortune of the oil magnate John D. Rockefeller, his grandfather. As a Rockefeller, Nelson fell into political influence almost by default, as enormous wealth brings enormous power and influence. Early in his career, he traveled extensively through Brazil and Latin America, promoting modernization in various roles during the presidencies of Roosevelt, Truman, and Eisenhower. He returned to New York State in the 1950s and became influential in state politics, winning election as governor of New York in 1958. 
which he served from 1959 to 1973. While a Republican, Rockefeller was more liberal than most in the party, and he was opposed by arch-conservatives like Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan. He promoted a number of liberal spending programs in New York, expanding the state's infrastructure, promoting environmentalism, and cooperating with labor leaders and unions. He was more conservative on social issues, most notably drug control, and he oversaw the passage of some of the nation's toughest drug laws in the early 1970s. Rockefeller found a reasonable niche in the 1968 election race, appealing to liberal Republicans and especially those opposed to the Vietnam War. While he had a distinct following, enough to win the Massachusetts primary on April 30th, it was never enough to claim a majority of the party, and he never seriously challenged Nixon for the nomination. In fact, as spring turned to summer, the chief rival to Nixon had become a fourth and final challenger, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan is a well-known American figure since he did go on later to become President of the United States in the 1980s, contributing to the end of the Cold War and a restoration of American pride after the disappointing decade of the 1970s. But his political star had not fully risen in the 1960s, so when he joined the race in 1968, he couldn't quite overtake the more well-established Richard Nixon. Reagan's background was in acting, where he was a prominent Hollywood star in the 1930s and 40s. Reagan was a New Deal Democrat in the 1930s and stayed in the party until 1962, when he found himself drawn to the conservative policies and social views of the Republican Party. He secured a reputation in the party when he gave a rousing speech in support of Barry Goldwater in 1964. Building on that momentum, Reagan joined the race for the governorship of California in 1966, winning surprising victories in the Republican primary against George Christopher, the mayor of San Francisco, and then against incumbent Pat Brown, the same man who had beaten Richard Nixon in 1962. Reagan defeated Brown resoundingly, 58% to 42%, signaling that he was now a force in the Republican Party. As the governor of California, Reagan now held one of the most powerful and important executive offices in the country, behind only the governor of New York and the president himself. So while he was relatively new to the highest levels of national politics, Reagan opted to join the presidential race in 1968. As the favorite son in California, Reagan ran uncontested in the primary and secured a block of delegates from California, even without really campaigning. He managed modest levels of support in some of the other primaries, again without actively campaigning. When the candidates arrived in Miami for the convention, Nixon had a wide lead in the delegate count, but had not yet officially sewn up the nomination. Reagan, seeing a glimmer of hope, formally announced his candidacy and attempted to join forces with Rockefeller to unseat Nixon as the favorite. We should again note that nothing like this could happen today, as there are many more primaries and the conventions now are more of a coronation than an actual election. In 1968, as I noted when discussing the Democratic side, it was entirely possible to arrive at the convention without a majority from the primaries and still win the nomination. Reagan hoped that if he could rally enough support to prevent Nixon from winning on the first ballot, that some of Nixon's supporters would switch to him on subsequent tallies. Nixon managed to maintain a firm grip on the Southern vote, and Rockefeller and Reagan split enough of the other votes for Nixon to win on the first ballot with 25 delegates to spare. Reagan then urged the convention to support Nixon unanimously. This was only Reagan's first attempt at the presidency, and as previously noted, his time in the sun would come later. Having secured the nomination, 
Nixon selected Maryland Governor Spiro Agnew as his running mate. In the general election, Nixon and Hubert Humphrey were the two major party candidates. Joining the race as a third party candidate was the governor of Alabama, George Wallace, who ran on a platform of segregation. This was the candidate that, as I mentioned in a previous lecture, James Earl Ray, the man who assassinated Martin Luther King, briefly worked for. Wallace understood that he would never rally enough national support to win the election, but he hoped that with a southern block of electoral votes, he might be able to sway whichever major party candidate needed his support the most to ensure that segregationist laws would remain in place. While Wallace did win several southern states, he didn't play a significant role in the final outcome of the election. As I've already described, Hubert Humphrey and the Democrats confronted some serious hurdles in the general election. The convention had been a disaster, and a disheartened Humphrey left the embattled city of Chicago, dispirited and glum. As Nixon gained momentum after a triumphant convention, Humphrey struggled to gain the full support of his party. A huge portion of the Democratic Party, which opposed the Vietnam War, were unhappy that the party had nominated a pro-war candidate and could not get behind Humphrey. Eugene McCarthy, who had spearheaded the anti-war campaign in the early going, refused initially to endorse Humphrey, leaving the party divided as the election approached. Finally, without the war as a decisive issue, Humphrey struggled to distinguish himself from Nixon. They were actually quite similar on many issues. From his end, Nixon managed to dodge specific questions on the Vietnam War, saying that he had a secret plan to end the war, but offering no specifics. One wonders whether a staunchly anti-war candidate like Robert Kennedy might have capitalized on this approach, but Humphrey was in no position to push the war as an issue, so Nixon's hedging didn't cost him many votes, if any. In the end, Humphrey took most of the Northeast and a smattering of states in the industrial Midwest, along with Texas. Wallace took five states in the Deep South, and Nixon won pretty much everything else. While the popular vote was quite close, the electoral map broke decisively Nixon's way, 301 to 191 electoral votes. As I noted previously, while Wallace did win several of those southern states, if you look at the electoral tally, the total in those states, even if they had all gone to Humphrey, would not have swayed the outcome in the election. The election of Richard Nixon, while symbolic in some ways, also represented a tangible end of the liberal 1960s. The silent majority had in fact won. The law and order candidate had won. The man with a secret plan in Vietnam had won. In the years that followed, the mood in the nation turned darker, as the sex, drugs, and rock and roll of the 60s faded into the early 1970s, mired with controversies and scandals. The Vietnam War, under Nixon's leadership, became even more chaotic, ruthless, and in the minds of many, morally corrupt. The secret plan, initially non-existent, eventually took the form of ruthless bombings of civilian centers, top-secret operations often involving torture, senseless massacres, and the invasion of neighboring nations, Laos and Cambodia. The anti-war movement soon enveloped the majority of the country. And Nixon came to be known as the madman in the White House, a chameleon-like figure whose motives were impossible to figure, deeply suspicious of those around him and paranoid about his own fate. Eventually, his paranoia was his undoing, as he authorized an illegal and secret campaign of political sabotage leading up to the 1972 election, which he probably would have won with ease anyway. His misdeeds and the profound corruption of his administration eventually came to light in the Watergate controversy.
But again, these events take us well beyond the year 1968, and we'll have to wait for another course to be fully explored. For now, it's enough to know that Nixon's election knocked the wind out of many Democrats, bringing an end to an age of peace, hope, and liberal reform. As the year drew to a close, many Americans looked to 1969 with dread. Thank you.